You're gonna see that this service is not gonna be a quiet one, so be ready. Are you? Many of you might know that we do have a Spanish-speaking ministry here, Unity Triangle Español. And as I was preparing for today's service upstairs, that's why I leave after the first part of the service to go upstairs and do that. Um, preparing on explaining our new folks what the new thought is. So you know, unity is part of the new thought movement. And I found this beautiful quote that I would like, love to share with all of you this morning. So you know, the New Thought Movement has its influences from the Greeks, Eastern philosophy, and of course, the teachings of Jesus. It practices in the 20th and 21st century what Jesus taught in the first century. He taught healing, it practices healing. He said, judge not, he sees, it sees the good in others. He said, take no anxious thought for tomorrow. It practices divine supply. He taught love and brotherhood. It is demonstrating unity and cooperation. The new thought is the Christ thought made new by being applied and proved in everyday affairs. New thought is a positive, constructive, a philosophy of optimism a true philosophy of life and happiness. In other words, don't worry, be happy. Let's bring that on as we start today's service and let's make that our affirmation. I wanna hear everybody. Don't worry, be happy. Here's a little song he wrote You might want to sing it note for note But don't worry Be happy In every little life there's trouble If you worry, you make it double Don't worry Be happy got no place to lay your head somebody went and took your bed but don't worry don't worry now be happy landlady say your rent is late she may have to litigate but don't worry be happy smile don't worry don't worry now just be happy cuz when you worry your face will frown and that might bring everybody down but don't worry be happy
Don't nobody worry now, just be happy. It's really hard to smile and whistle at the same time. <laughs> Please stand now and join us in singing Praise God that Good is Everywhere. Take a moment and greet the beautiful spirits of Christ and the people all around you. Two, three. <laughs> Y'all can sing.
rising sun Three little birds Sit there on our doorstep They sang sweet song Melody pure and true I say this is our message to you Baby, don't worry Don't worry about a thing, no, no, no Every little thing gonna be all right. Oh no, don't worry. Worry about a thing, no, no, no. Every little thing gonna be all right. Every thing. I'm telling you that every little thing is gonna be all right. Oh, you we're gonna have some fun today. Want to welcome everybody to our official 11 o'clock service. Those of you who have just connected or have connected, thank you for saying yes to this time with all of us. May you feel the love and the companionship that we all share here with one another. I do have some announcements. I would like to let everybody know that next Sunday we're having a party, another party. Um, and this time is um, centered on the opportunity for you to step up and get to know all the volunteer opportunities that we have in this community for you to make a difference and for you to help us support the operation of this magnificent ministry. There's going to be food, drinks, fun people, um, and it will be after each service. If you would like more information so far or ahead of time in our newsletter, you will see all the different groups that are already available for you to participate in. Then like every month, Dr. Marsha Walters offers her gift and talent in her series, Science and Spirituality. And this upcoming Sunday at 1.30, she will do one workshop on psychic healing, yes. And then the upcoming Saturdays, January 25th, is our new member class. And I must say I'm really excited about what this new format of the membership class will be. We have been working on creating videos. It's gonna be really, you're gonna be impressed if you, are not a member yet and would like to become one or understand more about what it entails, I highly recommend you come to that new member class on the 25th. And then, uh, as you know, prayer chaplains here are precious volunteers. They pray with our community and they are recruited once a year in January. If you have failed the notch to this calling, or if you just want to learn more about the requirements to become a prayer chaplain, today after this ser service, you'll be given an opportunity to know more. This meeting as well as all training sessions are required to become a prayer chaplain. Come explore if this is yours to do. And to give you more information about the spiritual aspect of being a prayer chaplain in this community, I'm gonna call up one of the most handsome, gorgeous looking men in our community and our prayer chaplain, Tim Oak. I thought you were gonna call someone else. <laughs> no, it's you. <laughs> um, I'm Tim Oak, I am currently a prayer chaplain um, but I'd like to talk to you about the first time I went to see a prayer chaplain. This was a number of years ago, uh, and I was new to Unity, so I didn't know a lot of the stuff we, we rely on now, um, and I didn't know a lot of people. Uh, but our family received some painful news, um, and I, I live in a different state than them, so... I just kind of was going through that feeling pain and feeling lost and not really knowing what to think that I think happens 
to all of us every once in a while. And I was sitting in a church service and I felt an urge to speak with the prayer chaplain, although that urge was very something I wasn't used to. Um, and my mind was telling me all the reasons why I shouldn't. Um, but I ended up going and I don't remember all the words and what happened, but I do remember the feeling of being welcomed and kind of loved and kind of lovingly accompanied out of all the activities to a place where I felt comfort and calm. Um, uh, and it was just what I needed at that time. <clears throat> so fast forward a few years, uh, they had a similar time of, of the year where they're asking people to be prayer chaplains. And again, I had never planned to do that. It wasn't something on my calendar. When it came up, I just felt that feeling again that I still wasn't uh, that familiar with. Um, and my mind was all these reasons why I couldn't be a prayer chaplain. Um, but I went anyways and became a prayer chaplain. And so I must say that um, the program here is, is very supportive. They, they teach you things about a process and it helped ease my mind um, with the structure and the support. But what I've come to believe is that being a prayer chaplain is more than just what we do and what we say. Um, it, I think the special part is sacred space. And that, I realized, was what I felt the first time when I, when I went to a prayer chaplain. Um, and the program helps us when we, we have retreats and we just get together with these people to feel safe and to experience that sacred space and to become more familiar with it. We practice things, we get better at accessing it and to understand it. So, um, I've had occasions as a prayer chaplain to have people come to me with whatever their circumstances is in a similar state than I was that time. Kind of hurting, kind of feeling lost. And to be able to be with them and, and to make them feel comfortable and to just be kind of a, a witness or to, to go with them through that getting out of the, the, um, the pain and confusion into that spiritual place within themselves, that experience is, is kind of magical. When whatever is theirs to experience happens, that's, that's the magic. That's like experiencing God. And that is why I like to be a prayer chaplain. So um, my ask to you is if you feel that urging in your heart to speak to a prayer chaplain, but you're having resistance in your mind to be brave and do it. Um, if you feel something in your heart that you might want to become a prayer chaplain, but your mind is telling you why you can't, follow your heart. You don't need to commit right now. Just come to the meeting afterwards and see how it feels. Thank you. So Tim, we were all in that sacred space with you. I love it. Thank you, and we love our prayer chaplains. Thank you for all you do and the power of your presence in this church. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Okay, so talking about prayer, I would love to have a prayer with all of you as we transition into the core spiritual aspect of our service. So let us pray. And again, let's start this prayer with a sincere smile. As we remember the words of the song, praise that good, it's everywhere. Praise to all the love we all share. And that just brings a smile to our face for it gives us peace. 
a sense of safety, a sense of well-being that has nothing to do with what is happening out there. We just get comfortable in the power of these words and this truth. And we do it together right here and right now. Knowing that the good is everywhere. For God, it's all also everywhere. And God is good. And as we let these words be anchored in our consciousness, we realize that we could extend the blessing that comes from knowing truth into those who at this moment could use, could benefit from this vibration of truth. So we bring the whole country of Australia Blessing the people, the plants, the animals, all of nature, and holding divine order and divine good, expressing through the circumstance. And we extend this blessing to my island, Puerto Rico, as it trembles. We hold everybody there in this safety, in this sense of unity, good and love that we are never a part of. And as we hold it for these two places, we also hold it for this country at this moment as it relates to all the other countries in the world. We affirm, praise that good is everywhere. For it is in me, it is in my consciousness. And I bring this consciousness as my gift to the world and to humanity. And for the opportunity of doing it here, all of us, as one family, one mind, one love, we say thank you, God. And so it is. And in this continuous flow of light and good, we affirm that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. As we sing and know and expect. Let us pray. We allow the breath to transport us 
into the sacred temple of our open heart space. We release all seeming circumstances and we rejoice in our complete oneness with spirit. We lift up every prayer request and every sacred being in this world to the omnipotent embrace of divine presence. We claim the universal activation of our indwelling Christ consciousness. We know that every one of us is the sacred embodiment of divine sufficiency. We are more than enough. We entrust every perceived challenge to the miraculous transformation of all-encompassing love. We are grateful to serve as the instruments of divine expression that we truly are. And all is well. Amen. As we begin to move into meditation, let us set the intent that we more clearly realize our true nature, our divine, our spiritual nature, and that that become more of our identity and who we know ourselves as. So having set the intention, let us move into deeper relaxation, relaxing the body, adjusting how we sit, and allowing the breath to become the focus of our attention. We breathe and we are aware of the breath. And when our mind wanders from that breath, we bring it back and pay attention again to the breath. Just so we integrate the being. As we move inward, we might ask this question of ourselves, who's having this experience of sitting here? Who's having the experience of being here? 
And when the answer comes back, I am, then look to see who is the I am that said that. Bring your attention on the awareness itself. the mind wanders, ask who is aware that the mind is wandering, and then bring it back to this I am presence again. sit together in holy silence in this place let us continue to explore who's having this experience
today we're going to be asking the question, uh, do I have enough to be happy? And um, just, <clears throat> I just want to say that uh, one of the things that uh, usually lets people know if you're happy is if you're smiling. And I was watching my video a couple of weeks ago, and I s just all I could say to myself was, uh, you could smile once in a while. <laughs> so I'm practicing <clears throat> today. And I need your help. You know, you, I was once at a, a, a talk in Los Angeles, uh, Gananda Center, um, in uh, right on the coast there, and the um, the guy who was doing the talk had the robe, but he had this enormous grin on his face the whole time. And after a while, I felt a little uncomfortable because I wasn't smiling back at him, and I didn't know is this appropriate anyway. So. If you'll help me, that'd be great, right? Just, there you go, thank you. Um, so, uh, do we have enough? Do we have enough to be happy? I guess most of you, being Unity people or having at least been in one of these churches once before, you probably go, yes, of course, I have enough. But let me break it down a little bit, if, we, if I may. So I think the real, the real deep happiness comes when you recognize your true nature. It's not like all the things that happen over here. It's like when you actually get who you really are. Um, this, this experiment we did during meditation where you ask who's having this experience is, is a way of directing your attention toward the divine aspect of you or the eternal, the, the transcendent aspect of yourself. And you ask who's having this experience, it's almost like you step back from the experience and you move into this place of witnessing. And then if you keep asking that question, who's having this experience and, and what is the nature of it and how does it work, you begin to go farther and farther into this mystery of who we really are. Because it seems to me when you really look at it, we have, this, we have a body, we have a mind, we have emotions, we have all that experience, but there is some part of us, there's some some part that's invisible. But this, is, this part of us, if you close your eyes and you withdraw from the world just a second, you realize, wow, that thing is as big as, as the whole world. It, 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 it occupies as much space interiorly as I see on the outside. It is huge. And this become, can become our deeper knowing of who we are. And when we know ourselves as that and feel that and let our attention be on that, there's a sense of happiness and a sense of peace that comes. And that's that whole awakening to our divine nature through love, service, and personal transformation. This is the nature that we're talking about. So as that happens, one of the things that will happen is that you will have a greater sense of peace and happiness, which is going to be great, right? That's what you're really after. But, uh, you say, but, that sounds great and wonderful, but I live in this world, how do I become happy here? And I think that's a valid question because, you know, staying here uh, is not just for saints, not just for gurus and people, it's for everyone, but the tendency is to be drawn into the world. To be drawn into the world and to feel like, oh my gosh, this has got to, this has to work out in some way for me to be happy. I need, and I'm, I, need to, I may need to adjust something. And, and, and so you, you, you go from like way up here into kind of being recognized, thinking this is who you are. And then thinking this is who you are, you, you go, I'm gonna have to adjust the body. Or I'm gonna have to adjust the outer world. Something has to change for me to be happy, right? right? So what we really want to do is to be able to do both. To be out here and to feel, know our divine nature and to have this part of the, the body-mind configuration in its optimal state of happiness as it can do. So it's both being aware of your awareness and also having thing work. And to make this thing work, I have a few suggestions. There's been quite a few studies or, or not maybe quite a few, there's been some studies based on how much money do you need to be happy, right? And it's it very interesting that almost universally when asked that question, how much money 
do you need to be happy? People say one and a half times how much I have. So it really doesn't matter too much how much you have. It's not an absolute number. Uh, it does seem to be a, a diminishing return. As you, as you gain income, it may be in the first, when you don't have much at all, there's a bit of misery that goes with that, and then it gradually increases. But once it reaches a certain plateau, it begins, it, 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 it doesn't keep rising. It kind of flattens out. And so... Many of you might be at that point where more won't really bring you any more happiness. And some of us are on the way up and where more would actually seem to bring us more happiness. But you have to know at some point that money, just accumulation of money, probably, probably in your case, maybe in, maybe in the future, maybe right now, probably isn't going to be the thing that makes you more happy. So the question is, will I, what do I do with the money? Well, it turns out there is a way that money can make you happy, and it's rather odd, when I first heard it, it's rather odd, that the, 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 the way that money will make you happy is, is by doing something for somebody else with it. It seems like, especially in our culture, which is so, gimme, 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 get faster, faster, I want more, that it turns out to be happy, which seems to be the goal of almost everybody, to turn out to be happy the way to do it is to give some away. So there was a, a guy who um, started doing experiments on this, and he started college campuses, and he gave, gave uh, um, $5 to a group of students, and half of them, he said, spin it on yourself. And the other half, he said, spin it on somebody else. They took, a, took the, the uh, phone calls afterwards, and they said, well, so what was your experience? Were you happier if you spin it on yourself? And the average was no. No happier, no sadder. Nothing changed, really. Now, to the other side, they said the people who gave the money to somebody else, they were happier. And so he thought, well, let's see what it's like with more money or with less money. And so uh, $5 or $20 or $20, and it turns out that either $5 or $20, it doesn't really matter you feel happier because you gave to somebody else. So he said, well, that's pretty cool for college students to have just stuff. They t tend to be, um, tend to be anyway, in some way. Up, um, what do you call it? Uh, probably upper middle class in some way. This, this, where this guy was doing it. So um, one of the things that he did was then try it in other places. My mic is kind of going wacky, that's why I'm over here. But I'm going to keep smiling, because <laughs> it really doesn't matter, does it? Anyway, so they go to um, different countries, and the different countries, as they do the different countries, they find that it's actually universally true. It seems like everywhere in the world, except for one country, one odd country, actually, well, it didn't work. They, they gave it money to people, and they didn't. They were no happier when they gave it away. They were happier when they kept it. But the country right next to it had the extreme version of the more they gave it away, the more happy they were. So it's really hard to tell, probably not geographical. Who knows why it's so in that country? But everywhere else, including this country, as you give it away, you become happier. If you keep it, nothing much changes. And so if, money want, if you want your money to buy you happiness, then you have a way of doing it, which is to give it to somebody else and to do something for somebody else. And it doesn't have to be heroic, necessarily, because according to this guy's uh, research, if you gave your mother a purse, and even though she doesn't need another purse, but you did something for her, you have a sense of happiness. But also, if you saved a kid by giving your neighbor uh, enough money to buy malaria medicine, and that kid was saved, you also feel happy. So it's kind of like it really doesn't matter. It's like this idea, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I mean, st just research, statistics, science. It's more bless blessed to give than to receive. Who knew? Right? It just sounded good. I thought that was all it had to do was sound good. But it seems like it actually is true. If you give, you are happier for it. And when you really think about it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, 
especially here in this country, not, not many of us are starving. Some of us don't eat well and don't have all we want, but most people, and that's not universally true, but most people in this country have food to eat and have clothes to wear and that sort of thing. And yet we can be quite miserable, right? We can have a brand new car, live in a good house. We can go to the movie. We can eat at a restaurant. And we could have the worst week of our lives, right? So if you were in a third world country looking at this country, you'd say, well, wow, if you had all that stuff, wouldn't you necessarily be happy? And it turns out if you live here, no, you're not. Not necessarily. You can be. So the trick is to figure out how to give it in such a way that you find happiness. So that's one way. Second way is to do with your life do spend your time focused on what really is intrinsically satisfying to you. As Lucille Ball says, knowing what makes you happy is a great leg up. But when that, that doing, when that doing is involved, it's not the doing that comes, oh, so I'll get this great outcome. It is what is intrinsically pleasant for you satisfying, do that doing. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you're doing it for the outcome, you may not be happy. I built a boat. Uh, I built silver bolts. I, I kind of like the process. It's so demanding. I don't do it but every 17 years. And so I'm pretty sure I'm never going to build another one. Or at least the trajectory looks that way. But I finished this boat. I, I, um, a few years ago. But in the years before I was finishing it, I would spend a lot of time uh, on weekends going and cutting wood and gluing or screwing it together or, or whatever it was, and making this thing happen. And I loved the process. I loved, at the end of the day, I would have had a, a lot of time when I wasn't really thinking about anything but exactly what I was doing. I, ha I was really pretty happy with the whole thing. And then the boat was complete, and it was a beautiful boat, and it was just like it was designed. It was everything I had thought it was going to be, except it was really tippy. It was extremely, t it was a sailboat. It was a really tippy sailboat, and many of the people who came with me only came once. <laughs> and, um, and ultimately, it was not very satisfying. The thing, the outcome, was not very satisfying. The years of making it, and I've spent many more hours making it than I have using it, that was satisfying. So you think about the people who have perhaps a job that doesn't pay enormously well, but they have, on a daily basis, they have a chance for satisfaction. Now, I'm not a school teacher, but I do recognize they are very important people in this world, and they are not traditionally paid very well. And yet, my fantasy is, at least, that quite often they have a ch chance to feel deep satisfaction in what they're doing. That in the doing itself, they might have deep satisfaction. I Granted, if they don't, there are lots of ways that could be very unsatisfying, but if you're a teacher and you're teaching, that's great. If you're an artist and you're painting or, or sculpting, that's great. If you're a doctor and doctoring, that's great. If you're an entrepreneur and you're making something happen, that's great. It's, but if we only find the happiness in the outcome, there's a really good chance we'll live in dissatisfaction or disappointment. The Buddha said that life is disappointment when we, the famous phrase is life is suffering. What he meant was you're disappointed often. The suffering comes because we wait for the outcome and then it arrives and then it is, is good or not as good as we wanted. But if it's as good, then at some point it also ends because all things that are manufactured end, all things in your life end. And so there's dissatisfaction on both sides. So life is dissatisfaction if it's about results, but it can be fulfilling if it's about the process and about what you're actually doing. 
So one is to give away. The other is to spend your time doing what is inherently satisfying. I think the third one is this. There's a phrase by, um, it's over there. <laughs> there's, a, there's a phrase by um, um, somebody. It basically says, the most dangerous caution that you have in your life is to be cautious with your love. And I think our being, our net, the net of who we really are, needs to reflect this high aspect of who we are. And that is why when we give, we find satisfaction. And when we love, we find satisfaction. Now, I know that there's at least as many love songs about unrequited love or broken hearts and that sort of thing. So it doesn't have to be just romantic love I'm talking about. It can also be about loving your neighbor, loving your dog, loving the world as it is, just loving. To have this vibration of loving in itself is a, is a, big, is a stepping stone to deep satisfaction. And with it can come, and probably will come, heartache, the broken heart, the, or, the, or, the, or the sensitivity to others' suffering that, that will feel as, as your own suffering and to some degree. Yeah, that will happen. That's going to happen also. But without it, there's not this deep connection. There's not this transcendent, not just about me feeling. It's like, we're locked inside this body and this mind. And this body and this mind, as the Buddha said, is dissatisfaction. We must escape it. So one is to recognize your divine nature. Two is to give. Three is to love. These are, these are methods of becoming more than you were when you were just seeking happiness. For a country that is a, who has a foundational phrase of in the pursuit of happiness, we do a lot of Prozac. <laughs> we need new methods. We need something different. Thich Nhat Hanh said, back to smiling, Thich Nhat Hanh said this, sometimes you're smile because of something that has happened to you that brought you happiness. Sometimes your smile brings you happiness. I think physiologically we're, we're wired to listen to our face, right? You walk around with a scowl, you walk around with a, an old tired face that's <laughs> tired, and you will feel that way. Or walk around like a kid who's just like blown the doors off of his last greatest fantasy, and it is basically a fantasy for the children, and they're excited about some fictitious thing that they've made up in their own mind, but they're just running around happy, and all of a sudden they completely made happiness out of nothing. Have you noticed? They can be like thrilled to be fantasizing about something and play acting and laughing and right. Nothing, nothing tangible is real, but in their mind, they have moved to a place of happiness, and they laugh, and they tell stories, right? Who do you want to be, a child that laughs, or an old man who's grumpy? <laughs> I don't know. So... <clears throat> One thing in the research about how to be happy, one thing about the research, well, the money couldn't do it, and fame and um, acclaim couldn't do it. But one thing that did seem to stick with people was being loved and appreciated. Being loved and appreciated, part of a community, part of a family, part of something that was working, that seemed to really work. Being loved and appreciated. And so we talk about this all the time, this, this 
this emergency that's in this world these days of loneliness, where people are feeling lonely. And, and um, they actually, uh, when they take your blood, if you're feeling really lonely, your white blood cells are acting just like you're in a, in a um, you have an infection. It, they just, they're running around trying to be very active to fix something that the body knows something is really wrong when you're really lonely. And so building a community, a nest, building a family, all those things are, or developing friendships, fr friendships that take your loneliness away, those kind of friendships, building those friendships, perhaps getting off the internet and getting out into the world. These things lead to actually a greater sense of self-satisfaction and happiness. So you're in the right place, in my opinion. This is a place where you are invited to build friendships, to be belong, to become an owner. The, and you know how you become an owner here, don't you? No? I'll tell you. So you become an owner by contributing into it. You contribute somehow. You give of yourself somehow. It's, it could be with your money, it could be with your time, it could be with your, your, your prayers. You give into it, and, and giving into a community, it becomes yours. Now, if it works here, it probably works at home, too. As you give into your friends or your family, it becomes your friends and family. And so the more we give, the more we receive. The whole thing is like a gestalt of, of emanating from yourself kindness, love, time, talent, and treasure, all that, as you are this person rather than this person, the odds of your happiness go up enormously. And as you are this person, as well as this person, the likelihood of you being miserable goes down enormously. We are not without resources. No matter what we have, we can give something away. I was talking with someone between services. He said, I hitchhiked from here. He hitchhiked from here to, to Berkeley, California. And of course, the first thing he ran into in Berkeley, California was hey, can you spare a, a dollar? And he said, I had 25 cents left. He says, well, I don't have a, a dollar, but I'll buy you a cup of coffee. So I bought this guy a cup of coffee. This was a long time ago because he said it was 11 cents. <laughs> and he had one for himself, so he was, that was two 11 cents, so he's down to three cents. Well, I said, well, what happened next? He goes, well, then I got this job, and I... You know, everybody was saying, you can't get a job, but I got this job, and, and it turned out, you know, I used to hitchhike all around, and I don't know why he told me this, but he said, I used to hitchhike around, I had always had hundreds of dollars stuffed in all my pockets. I'm thinking, that's a long way from three cents, because this is how I think it works with money. Money is attracted to happiness. Success is attracted to happiness. Families that fight over money, it's usually, in my opinion, the opposite. They're unhappy, and money becomes a way of expressing it, the unhappiness. And the sense of not having enough amplifies when you're not getting along. It diminishes when you are getting along. It's, it's, it's not, money is not it. It's a symbol. As one person said, you know, there's a lot of, been a lot of misery in this world, and so people were getting together to think a lot about how to fix the misery. But the pro and one of the ways they were thinking about it was how to move these little green pieces of paper around, but it turns out the little green pieces of paper never were miserable, so they couldn't address the problem properly. Let's realize we have enough to be happy. This question is easily answered yes. We have enough. 11 cents for a cup of coffee was enough for this guy to be happy. He probably got that. You might need a dollar and 11 cents now, but something like that. We are intrinsically capable of happiness, just as we are. Nothing more needed. 
The soup has been made. All we have to do is drink it. Let us pray. So as we move into meditation, move a little deeper into the meditation, let us, let us contemplate. Contemplate who we really are. Could it be we're not this body and all the things that are affecting the body's world cannot hold us away from our own happiness? It's just stuff. And could it be that if we extend our smile to the world, it will be first on our face. And it will remind us that we have that ability to be happy right now. We can remember to give, to love. To not be completely about ourselves. Without needing the outcome to come back to us. That we give without return. We don't give to please that someone will think good of us. We just give because it turns out to be our nature. The nature that when we tap into it, we are happy. So let's commit to loving, to giving, to smiling, but let us never forget who we really are, for this is the pearl of great price. This is the lotus that unfolds. This is joy itself. And so it is. Amen. Uh, as part of the community building around here, we do a, a twice a year, we have con uh, congregational meetings, and one of them is going to be coming up in two weeks on the 26th of January. It's after this service, so you can just not sure if we're going to give you time to get coffee or not, but usually we do. We give you coffee and then ask you to come back here. It's not a really long thing, but it is kind of interesting to hear um, who's going to be choosing your next board members and also to, to see um, what it takes to run this church financially. You'll, we'll, we'll be approving the budget. I, I, um, I, I, I always think... Um, this is like your citizenship thing. This is like civics here. You have to do this once a year. So come once. If you haven't been part of this, you might want to try it. Yeah, okay, I made my pitch. <laughs> now, we're also going to do our offering. So remember now, as all, all I said was, you know, as you give, you're, you will receive. But, and so and I know some of you can give in the big numbers. And some of us have 11 cents. All of it will work if you give from your heart with these thoughts behind it. All of it will help transform the way you feel, the way you experience life. And it will build a stronger community here and it give you a bigger place, a more healthy place to be part of. So let's, let's bless our gifts as we do it together. Divine love as me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And now, let's smile again. You seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here, you can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space. I don't care.
there, baby, by the way. Because I'm not that long. If you feel like a room without a roof, clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Clap along if you know what happiness means to you. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Here come bad news, talking this and that. Don't hold back Well, I should probably warn you That I'll be just fine No offense to you Don't waste your time Because I'm happy I belong If you feel like a room Without a roof Clap along If you feel Like happiness is the truth Okay, if you, if you all will stand, we'll give you a blessing. And we see these words from our hearts so that you will always remember them and not go through life without the satisfaction of being who you are. Let's say these words together. Together? You are loved, special, and important just the way you are. Now let's join hands and sing the peace song. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. 
Wherever we are, God is and all is well. Enjoy your week.